So now we're going to look at the, the forces between molecules, intermolecular forces. And that uh, includes forces not just between molecules, but uh, atoms, ions, etc. So these are the forces that uh, make gases turn into something else. So gas does not have any significant intermolecular force. Solids and liquids do. So they're stuck together as a solid or as a liquid because they have some attractive force between the molecules. And uh, the stronger that attractive force, the more it sticks as a solid or liquid. So the more it affects melting point or boiling point. So strong intermolecular forces are seen by high melting points, high boiling points. This is one of the easy distinct features is this watching how melting points and boiling points change. Now we use the melting point and boiling point to help us to understand um, what the forces, how the forces relate to each other. So we're going to look at a, a whole spectrum of uh, compounds that we find out there. The strongest that we have, the highest melting points, boiling points, are going to be uh, network covalent compounds. So network covalent compounds would include diamond and graphite. Diamond is a three-dimensional carbon network. Graphite is a two-dimensional carbon network. We have other uh, compounds, carbides, nitrides, uh, that uh, fall into this category of uh, network covalent. A compound. The intermolecular force between the atoms of carbon is actually covalent bonds. Uh, but this is an extended two dimensional or three dimensional network, so we don't have a um, a uh, molecular uh, formula to attach onto it. Um, so the covalent network is our highest. So diamond and, and graphite, have, out of all the elements, they have the highest melting point uh, out of all the elements because they form this network covalent type of uh, compound. The next strongest, so that would be our strongest uh, intermolecular force. So our strongest intermolecular force, our weakest, our strongest, our net, Next strongest will be ionic compounds. They're going to be made with uh, metals uh, and nonmetals. And we have one uh, polyatomic ion that can substitute for metal, it's the ammonium ion, NH4. So we see NH4 with some other nonmetals. We see a metal with some nonmetals. We know it's going to be a ionic compound. Uh, metals would be the next. Uh, category. Ionic compounds are all solids. Uh, metals, we're starting to get uh, some liquids in our metals. So we have uh, liquid mercury, uh, and then slightly above room temperature, we have gallium and uh, some other uh, mixtures like Wood's metal. Uh, but any metal mixture, be a pure element or a mixture of several different metals, they all have this metallic bonding on, on them. So the ionic binding is very strong. It's a, a pure electrostatic attraction between positive and negative ions in our ionic compound. For metallic, they're sharing their electrons, and the sharing is throughout the whole uh, network of the metal, which is why metals are electrically conducting. And uh, most metals are solids. Uh, we do have uh, mercury, gallium that are uh, low melting points. So we see that are uh, getting a little bit weaker here on our melting points, our melting points are going down. The next category would be covalent compounds. We identify these with nonmetals bonded to nonmetals. But we have uh, three subdivisions of that. Uh, the first subdivision between polar and nonpolar. Uh, so a polar compound has a partial charge separation um, it, within the compound. So it's not a full positive negative as you find in the ionic. It'll just be a partial positive, partial negative. 
And this happens when we have a non-symmetric molecule. And uh, non-symmetric can mean different atoms attached to the central atom, but we have a lone pair on the central atom. The intermolecular force associated with that one would be a dipole-dipole force. So the, the polar compound has a dipole on it. That shows that we have a partial charge separation across the molecule. We can draw an arrow across the molecule from a, the positive side to the negative side. So the interactive force, intermolecular force, is a dipole-dipole force. In that polar category, we have a, a subset. And that subset is when we have hydrogen directly attached onto nitrogen, oxygen, or chlorine. So these are our three most electronegative elements and the three smallest of the nonmetals. So that combination creates a very special extra strong dipole across the bond between the nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and the hydrogen. So this hydrogen also will, uh, on, from one molecule, will attach itself onto the lone pair of these on a different molecule. That is the hydrogen bond. Uh, so if we look at water, we have our... And I think with myself room, let me give myself a little room here. So that we have a, a larger than normal dipole charge separation. So this hydrogen is more positive than we find it on other polar compounds. So it uh, attaches on to the lone pair on the oxygen or nitrogen or chlorine, and that is our hydrogen bond. So it holds on pretty well between here, stronger than a dipole dipole. We see that in our melting points and boiling points. So uh, the compounds that can do with this hydrogen bonding have a higher melting point, higher boiling point than just a polar compound. But we have to have the hydrogen directly attached onto these three elements, one of these three elements. So if, it's, if they're both on the same compound but not attached together, it's not hydrogen bond. If we have a nonpolar covalent compound, that would be a highly symmetric molecule uh, that would be including the same atoms attached to the central atom. And when the electron geometry equals molecular geometry, which is another way of saying that there's no lone pairs on the central atoms. So when we have a nonpolar compound, we don't have this permanent charge separation. What we have is a temporary transient charge separation. Uh, we call this dispersion. So as the electrons are flying around the molecule, every so often there'll be a partial charge separation. The electrons be a little higher density on one side, make that partial negative, a little lower on the other side, make it partial positive. Adjacent molecules will feel that charge separation and reflect back the opposite charge. So that creates an attractive force to help hold them together. So this dispersion force, though, uh, this depends upon the size of that electron cloud. So it grows as a molecule gets bigger. So dispersion is our weakest of the intermolecular forces. But as the size of the molecule gets bigger, this one gets larger also. And um, let me just... Uh, Do an example on that one. We have a. So there's three different hydrocarbons. Uh, hydrocarbons are always nonpolar. So between three different hydrocarbons, the difference then, there are covalent compounds, there are nonpolar covalent compounds. 
the difference is only in the size of the molecule. So our smallest one is only one carbon, this is a gas. So that's natural gas. Uh, a C6, that would be a hexane. Hexanes are liquid. Then we get up larger, then this becomes a solid. So that'd be a, a, like a paraffin wax. So just the size of the molecule increases our melting point, our boiling point. The very last category of uh, compound types here is non-binding atomic uh, compounds. These would be the noble gases. So the noble gases uh, will only at, uh, attach to each other through dispersion. We have to get them very cold they, before they will condense into a liquid uh, or freeze into a solid. Um, so that is our weakest compound type, our weakest intermolecular force. So these are our intermolecular forces. If we can identify the compound type, we have come, we have identified our intermolecular force, and then we can attach it onto some of our physical properties. So the boiling point, and melting point, these uh, trend directly with our intermolecular forces. So a high melting point, high boiling point will be for the stronger intermolecular forces up on top here. Uh, so we're going to find our solids up on top. As you go down, these are the weaker uh, intermolecular forces, uh, weaker, lower melting points and boiling points. So we end up with gases as we come down here. Another property would be viscosity, how fast or slow things will flow, liquids will flow. So um, water is not the lowest, but water is relatively low. Uh, water would be in the middle right here. Um, if we play around with some other liquids, you we can see that some will just flow a little quicker and easier than water. They'll have a lower viscosity. And then like honey, molasses, uh, motor oil, they flow slower. So they have a higher viscosity. So high viscosity flows slowly. Low viscosity flows faster. So viscosity will also be affected by molecular complexity. We're just going to be looking at intermolecular forces. So if we're comparing them and we see stronger intermolecular forces, we're going to say higher viscosity. If we see weaker intermolecular forces, we'll say uh, lower viscosity. Another property is surface tension. So surface tension is how tightly the surface of a liquid is held together. Uh, we can see some things that will float in water, uh, little bugs, water striders. Uh, we can actually get a, a paper clip to float in water. If we put it on a little tissue paper, gently lower the tissue paper into the water and let the tissue paper, let the whole thing float, the paper will sink. And the paper clip, if it uh, still has a little bit of an oily coating on it, it'll be water phobic and it'll float. Uh, we certainly have other compounds that will have higher surface tension than water. Water, again, is in the middle here. So a high surface tension from being harder to penetrate the liquid. It wants to uh, hold itself together. Uh, so mercury is higher than water. Uh, we can, um, we don't get the chance to play with mercury anymore. Uh, but it resists the penetration harder than water does. So surface tension will increase with our intermolecular forces. Uh, decreased as our intermolecular forces get weaker. So these three, uh, four, boiling point, melting point, viscosity, surface tension, are all highest with strongest intermolecular forces, while lowest with weaker intermolecular forces. Vapor pressure is going to be the opposite. Vapor pressure is inversely proportional to boiling point. So boiling point is going to be high. Our vapor pressure is going to be low. I uh, have another video that looks more directly at vapor pressure and boiling point. But uh, for our solids, uh, we're going to have low vapor pressure. For our gases, we're going to have a high vapor pressure. So vapor pressure is going opposite of the rest of them. We have weak intermolecular force. The liquid or solid wants to enter into the gas phase easier. So we're going to have higher vapor pressure. If we have a strong intermolecular force, it's going to be held in the solid or liquid and we're going to have a low vapor pressure. So vapor pressure is going to be the opposite of the other ones. So let's look at some compounds. 
So we're going to be want to identify compound type uh, and uh, then intermolecular force and then relative uh, properties. So for sulfur trioxide, we see that we have a non-metal with a non-metal. We have a covalent compound. So what we want to do is say, is it polar or non-polar or is it hydrogen bonding? Well, we have no hydrogen whatsoever, so no possibility of hydrogen bonding. So if we just had the formula, we want to write it out the Lewis structure. This is our uh, best form of charge Lewis structure. Our octet obeying would have uh, only one double bond and two single bonds. But in all three cases, we have a highly symmetric molecule in that we have three identical oxygen attached to the sulfur. We have no lone pair in the sulfur. So our electron geometry is trigonal planar. Our molecular geometry is trigonal planar. So this becomes highly symmetric, which makes it nonpolar. So the compound would be a nonpolar covalent. See. Uh, polar covalent. So the intramolecular force uh, on a nonpolar covalent will be a dispersion force. Okay, so let's look at some others. Uh, so cesium chloride. Cesium is a metal, but chlorine is not a metal. So it's not a, a mixture of metal with metal. We have a metal with a non-metal. So we have an ionic compound. And that is the uh, type of intermolecular force also. On carbon dioxide, we have, again, a covalent compound, non-metal with non-metal. We have highly symmetric molecule. We have only oxygens attached onto the carbon, and we have no lone pair on the carbon. So this becomes a non-polar covalent. So let's uh, look at these compounds first, and then start to match them up. So CH4, any hydrocarbons are going to be non-polar. So once we see that we only have a hydrocarbon containing only carbon and hydrogen, we don't have to worry about the Lewis structure anymore. We just know it's going to be nonpolar. So this is nonpolar covalent. The C2H5OH, well, we have oxygen, so it's not a hydrocarbon anymore. Uh, whenever we have oxygen to an uh, organic compound, it's often, not always, often going to be polar at that point. Uh, but now we have that special case of the hydrogen directly on oxygen. So this is going to be hydrogen bonding. Uh, right below it, the same set here. So we have an OH, we have hydrogen bonding. Nonpolar covalent. Underneath we have iodine. That's a non-metal with a non-metal. So we have a covalent compound. We have just uh, two of the same compound. It's going to be a iodine, iodine, diatomic. So we have two identical things uh, together. We have uh, a straight line and no way of doing separation across these. So this is going to be a nonpolar covalent. And same with the chlorine.
And here we have, uh, again, we have that OH, H directly on oxygen, hydrogen bonding. And right here though, we don't have any um, hydrogen directly on the oxygen. We have hydrogen and oxygen in the same compound, but no hydrogen directly on the oxygen. So we don't have hydrogen bonding down here. The lone pairs on the oxygen will make this oxygen bent oxygen. Uh, so we can rotate this so that both of these are pointing down, the two lone pairs are pointing up. So we have a, a bent molecule, which will have a, a little dipole in this. It's not a strong dipole, but it's still going to be polar uh, covalent. So we have some setups here. So let's rank our intermolecular forces on these. And um, when we compare ionic with uh, any covalence, ionic is going to be strong. Ionic is our second strongest of these. So in terms of IMFs, intermolecular forces, our cesium chloride is going to be stronger than our carbon dioxide. And the next part down, we have nonpolar compared to hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is stronger than our nonpolar dispersion forces. So it's going to go the opposite direction. So let's um, put this in. So nonpolar would be dispersion. So we have dispersion a couple spots here. And then the polar down here, this is a dipole dipole. Okay, so the next one we have our dispersion with hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is a stronger one than dispersion. So here we have two different dispersions. So what we have to do is look at the masses of dispersions. We only have dispersions. The higher the mass, the higher the dispersion. And between chlorine and iodine, iodine has a higher mass. It's lower down on the table, higher mass than chlorine. So it'll have a stronger uh, dispersion force than chlorine does. Down here on the last one, we have hydrogen bonding compared to a dipole dipole. Hydrogen bonding is stronger than dipole dipole. So let's um, label some of our physical forces where they're going to be. So um, there's a little bit more room. Not very well. So the stronger intellectual force on ionic, we mean a higher. Uh, melting point, boiling point, viscosity, uh, surface tension. What we're here is going to flip around. Uh, we're going to have our Our melting point will be higher over here. Our boiling point, surface tension, viscosity. Now I'll include uh, this one down here, fits this category. And this one over here is going to fit this category. Uh, I didn't do the vapor pressure. Vapor pressure is going to be the opposite. So, over here on our carbon dioxide. That'll be our highest vapor pressure. 
so it'll be the opposite of our uh, melting point, boiling point. So our two over here, this would be our vapor pressure. So these will have a higher vapor pressure than these. This would be a higher vapor pressure over here. So the vapor pressure is going to be the opposite of the other category. So let's just look at a couple more. So looking at the uh, top set from us here, P cell five, this is going to be, uh, we have all identical azimuth no lone pairs on the uh, central phosphorus. So this is going to be nonpolar covalent. The next one, the ammonia, that has a lone pair on it. So even though we only have hydrogens attached onto it, that lone pair makes it not symmetric. So this becomes polar, but it's hydrogen directly on the nitrogen. So this is hydrogen bonding. So the nonpolar covalent, this will only be dispersion forces. So methane is nonpolar. So that wouldn't be dispersion forces. Um, nitrogen trichloride, we have that lone pair on it, so it's not highly symmetric, that makes it polar. But there's no hydrogen on the nitrogen, so it's not a hydrogen bonding. So this is from the dipole dipole. Okay, looking at the next set here, we have a hydrocarbon, so this is nonpolar. So that's only dispersion. This ether, dimethyl ether, uh, we have oxygen that generally makes these organic compounds polar. There's no hydrogen directly on the oxygen, so there's no um, hydrogen bonding. So we have a polar covalent. But without that hydrogen on the oxygen, this, this only has dipole dipole forces. And the last one, we have that oxygen directly on the hydrogen. So we have that oxygen on the organic compound making a polar covalent. Uh, oxygen, hydrogen direction on the oxygen makes it hydrogen bonding. So now we can rank them. So let's pick our rank them as best as we can. Our strongest intermolecular force is going to be our hydrogen bonding here. So we have our NH3 is going to be higher. Uh, we have our dipole. Dipole will be next. And we have two dispersion, but of the two dispersion, we're going to pick the bigger one, the one bigger mass, as having a higher dispersion. And then our smallest one will be our last. So that means that uh, our um, 
melting points are boiling points, viscosity, our surface tension. all have the same sequence. What's going to be the opposite direction would be our vapor pressure. So looking at the second sequence here, Of the three, the hydrogen bonding will be the strongest, and our dispersion will be our weakest. So that's our IMS. So same sequence here, our melting point, boiling point, be highest over here and gets lower over here, surface tension. Our um, viscosity, and what's going to go in the opposite direction will be our vapor pressure. So uh, this is uh, alcohol, so liquid at room temperature. Uh, evaporates relatively slowly. Uh, dimethyl ether is a liquid at room temperature, but it has a high vapor pressure, evaporates readily. And then our ethane is a gas already at room temperature, so it has the highest vapor pressure. This uh, evaporates readily, it has relatively high vapor pressure, and this evaporates slowly, it has a relatively low vapor pressure. 